cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year. The ways deep, and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camel's gall, sore-footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow, and the night fires going out, and the lack of shelters. The cities hostile and the towns unfriendly, and the villages dirty, and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night sleeping in snatches, with the voices singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. In these words, the poet T.S. Eliot describes the journey of the Magi from the east to Bethlehem. They were not kings, although often they are depicted as kings with crowns. If you look in our stable, you will see one uh, gentleman wearing a crown. But they were likely, very likely, not kings. Nor were there three of them. The Gospel doesn't say how many there were. They are called Magi, and it's from Magi that we get our word magician. So in some ways they were practi uh, practitioners of the, the dark arts, although these particular magicians were more interested in brighter things. They were interested in the stars. The stars were their stock and trade. They were stargazers. But there's a big difference, isn't there, from just gazing up at the sky at a star and actually getting up and leaving home and following that star. The Magi did have a hard time of it. They probably came from somewhere near Persia, uh, present-day uh, Iran. So it was a long way from that part of the world to Bethlehem. And the Gospel tells us that when the star stopped over the uh, place where the child was, that they were just filled with joy, seeing that finally the star that they'd been following for so long had finally come to rest. They were wildly happy. And they realized somehow that their journey was not folly, it was not foolishness, but perhaps the beginning of something new and wonderful. They were filled with joy because as they entered the house, opened their treasures, and worshipped the baby, the Magi knew that they had reached their long-awaited destination. Most of their fellow Magi had stayed home. There was no way that they were going to go on some wild camel ride to see a baby on the basis of nothing more than a star. But these Magi who had followed the star were the sort of people who were looking for something willing to risk a journey, brave enough to venture forth on a search. And when they got to the goal of their search, they felt that they had completed a journey that just might possibly change their lives. The journey of the Magi to Bethlehem had been a difficult one. It's a lot easier to travel now, but for many of us, travel has lost its glamour and appeal packed into airliners, have to go through all kinds of security at the airports, flight delays, all the rest of it. And so many of us now prefer to stay at home. But there is an advantage to staying home because when we're at home we're in control. We're in control of our surroundings. And when we leave home to take a journey we're never quite sure what's going to happen to us. So every trip we take is a risk. Every baby is a risk, too. The birth of Jesus set a whole train of difficult events in action. The baby that the Magi discovered was not the end of the journey, but only the beginning. It's the same for us. We believe in Jesus. And 
so we are willing to follow him wherever the journey leads. And in following him, has he, has he not taken us to places where we perhaps would not have gone without his leading? You know, our ancestors, our poor fathers and mothers who founded this, this parish, we're not sure where that would lead them. So they've made the journey, not seeing the beginning. And that is the, what we're invited to do, to make a journey, not always aware of how it's going to end. So like the Magi, we have seen his star rise in the east and have followed it. Now Matthew introduces us to another character in this epiphany story, and that's King Herod. So in the poor stable under the shining stars, the baby Jesus, king of the Jews, but up at the palace, backed up by his soldiers, is King Herod, who is the client king of the Jews. The Romans were very smart. They knew they had such a vast empire to govern that they needed to appoint people on the local scene. And if that person was from the, the local uh, place, he was more likely to be accepted. So Herod was a puppet king put in place by the Romans. Herod's boss was Tiberius Caesar. Herod was afraid of Tiberius Caesar. It's like you're saying that Herod was afraid of the boss. And Herod knew that you know he was responsible he was to keep everything calm and no riots or anything of that sort of, speaking of a new king or a new kingdom, that would not sit well with Caesar. So Herod knew that he had to do something about this reported new king of the Jews. There was no way that Herod or Caesar would put up with another kingdom, especially a kingdom of peace, justice, and nonviolence kingdom that was so opposed to the violence of the Roman Empire. And so the star filled Herod with fear. And not only Herod, but all Jerusalem, because when Herod was afraid, the whole city was afraid. Herod was not a nice man. He had already killed his wife. He killed three of his own sons. And he had killed most of his friends. But Herod turned all his sweetness upon the Magi. He tried to get them to give him the baby's exact whereabouts so that he too could come and worship him. That's probably the biggest lie he ever told. The Magi didn't go for it, of course. The Magi did not return to their home by Jerusalem, but by another way. But Herod was not to be frustrated. He sent all his soldiers and killed every Jewish boy under two years of age to make sure that this upstart king of the Jews would not compete against him or Caesar. So we've got quite a contrasting story here. The Magi filled with, with joy, with a sense of a new beginning, and Herod filled with murderous fear. So where do we find our place in this story? Are we the fearful Herod? Or are we the joyful Magi? I expect, if we are honest, we feel some kinship with both. With all the legions of Rome behind him, Herod was still afraid. And we, as a nation, powerful as we are, a large army backing us up, do not feel secure. We too are having a hard time of it, both in other countries where we're particularly not wanted, even in our own country with the gun violence, the economic situation, the fiscal cliff. We too are having a hard time of it. And on the personal level, what fears do we harbor in our hearts? What personal fears are holding us back? When we are afraid, we're not at our best. During the Great Depression, President Roosevelt told the American people, 
that they had nothing to fear but fear itself. He was so right. Fear produces so many unpleasant offspring. Anger, worry, anxiety, suspicion, and all the physical disorders caused by stress. <coughs> like a deer transfixed by the headlights of an oncoming car, fear can paralyze us from productive action and blind us to creative solutions. But by far, as we have seen, the worst offspring of fear is violence. It is not always physical violence, but violent attitudes, violent hearts, and violent speech. So when we allow fear to take control of our lives, we become like King Herod, but we're also like the Magi. In fact, seeing the Magi giving their gifts to the baby Jesus and kneeling in homage before him reminds us of what we are doing right now, what we are doing here in this church, this evening. We are worshiping, bending the knee before Jesus. The Magi might be called the very first church, the very first to bend the knee and worship Jesus. But it didn't stop there, as we know. And it doesn't stop in this particular building for us. Our worship is not the end of the journey, it's only the beginning. We are called to go forth from this church, perhaps to travel by another road, to relinquish our sense of control and comfort, and to go where the star and its Lord can lead us. We follow a living Lord, a demanding Savior who leads us forward. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, we have seen your light. Make us bold in venturing forth as your disciples. Make us joyful to follow your star, wherever it leads. Amen. We profess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. God's mystery is our inheritance. We can speak clearly for creation and for our own needs. For renewed evangelization, let God's living word flourish in all corners of the world, we pray to the Lord. Lord our for our president and for all national leaders, that they seek justice, peace, and freedom for all whom they serve, we pray to the Lord. 
For grandparents, for parents, and for all young people, that they continue to center their lives in God, we pray to the Lord. For all who gather here, and for our whole community, that God's presence among us be more clearly seen, we pray to the Lord. For those in special need of our prayers, those serving our nation in the military, the sick, those that have died, especially Teresa Caban, Michael Mahoney, Norma Damozonio, Anna Foy. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. We offer this Mass in a special way for Hai Nguyen. We pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, these are the prayers that we make to you on behalf of the whole world. We know that you will hear them, for we make them in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 